Hey, welcome back to Hacker Slacker. I'm Jacob Petticord. And I'm Andre Garive. And we got another show for you today. All right, so today we're going to go over a little bit of follow-up um, on some stuff on this podcast that we didn't quite touch on last week, uh, some of the tech that we've gone out and seen in the past week, um, and Jacob has some news about his phone. Then we'll go over some news stories, uh, including the acquisition of Red Hat by IBM, and then we'll go back through the iPad event that happened on Tuesday and talk about the predictions we made last week and what happened and what didn't. Yep. Okay. So starting out, one of the things that we forgot to talk about in our episode about podcasts is explaining the name Hacker Slacker. So a lot of people might see that name and think of like the typical connotation of the word hacker, which is like some guy in his mom's basement, like breaking into a bank security system or something like that. Um, but really there's this other definition of hacker that a lot of people use in startup culture and on the internet. That's just someone who's like, um, like, programming, like learning stuff on their own, kind of just putting stuff together in like a quick and uh, um, kind of efficient way. Is that how you would describe it? Yeah. So it's not the kind of hacking that you see in the movies, but it's more you're kind of hacking programs together. Um, there are things called hackathons where you go for two days and you try to throw something together as a team of three people and you just kind of create software and it's really hacky and it doesn't quite work, but... Uh, a lot of these people in tech like to call themselves hackers. Yeah, and it, oh, that name comes specifically from Hacker News because when I was originally doing these episodes, it started as like a summary podcast for that news website. Um, so the Hacker Slacker was kind of just like um, letting the ha- the slackers keep up with the hackers. Like it was kind of uh, we were serving the goal of like keeping you informed, even though like you're not trying to read every single news article which is still kind of the spirit of what we're doing now. And I think it's kind of a catchy name, so we're keeping it for now. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, we'll probably do a podcast on the differences between conventional hacking that you see in movies and what a lot of people in tech consider hacking. Um, but that's for another podcast. <laughs> yeah, so the next thing that I wanted to point out is that we were talking about with my iPhone 6 that I was using for the last week. Um, it didn't have force touch. Uh, and so I was talking about some of the challenges and the drawbacks because of that. And an interesting thing is that the new iPhone XR also doesn't have Force Touch um, because it's kind of the cheaper version, and that's one of the things that they chose to leave out from the XR versus the XS. Um, and the way that they got around a lot of the annoyances that I was having is that in iOS 12, uh, to do the keyboard insertion point thing, you long press on the space bar, which I thought was interesting. Um, so... Yeah, so we also saw a lot of this hardware in person, um, and that's for reasons that I'll go to in the next point of follow-up, but um, do we want to go into a little bit of what we thought about the 10R? and you said you saw the Pixel 3? Yeah, so <clears throat> I went to Best Buy uh, this past weekend, and I, I was there, so of course I checked out all the new phones, so I got to see the 10R for the first time, and wow, it is a really, really nice phone. Um, when you think of, like, the second-tier phone that isn't Apple's flagship, you just kind of feel... You get a reminder of the iPhone 5C, yeah. the iPhone SE, phones that were fine but weren't, like, great flagships-type phones. But yeah, so they're selling this as, like, the colorful phone, just like they sold the 5C, but, like, specs-wise and, like, uh, form-wise, it is nothing like the quality downgrade that the iPhone 5C was. Yeah, so the 10R, I was just kind of messing around with, and I held it next to my own iPhone X, and I was like, wow, this XR is more powerful because it has the newer internals, and it's essentially the exact same thing. Yeah, and it's bigger too. It's a nice like in-between size between the the XS and the XS Max that I think a lot of people would really like. Um, and the main thing about the screen is that it's lower resolution, but when I was holding the iPhone XR and the XS Max side by side, it wasn't something that was like extremely apparent even when I was looking for it. Yeah, so I think the whole experience of the 10, the 10s, the 10s Max and the 10R is going to be the same. You're not going to unless you want the bigger battery or bigger screen from the 10s Max, it's not really going to do much difference in what you get. Yeah, the the biggest other difference is the dual camera module yeah. which lets you do the uh, 2x zoom. Yes. So interestingly, I saw so the iPhone 10 and 10s and 10s Max use the uh, telephoto lens for po- portrait photos. Yeah. So 
when they use that, it zooms in and it actually decreases the quality of the photo uh, because you're using a less megapixel camera. But since there's only one on, one camera on the 10R, it uses that camera and it uses all software for the portrait mode. So some of the portrait mode photos actually turn out better on 10R than 10S. Interesting. So it's kind of like a Google <laughs> Pixel style portrait mode versus the yeah. using the two cameras and sometimes software is beating it. Yeah. So I thought that was really interesting. Do you want to talk about you seeing the Google Pixel 3? Yeah, so I worked on the Pixel 3, but I didn't actually get to see it all that much this summer since it was still, like, under wraps and all that. Um, so I, I held it and I messed around with it, but this was the first time I actually got to, like, dig in and look at it. And I took a selfie and it was insanely good. Uh, the camera on that thing is unbeatable. I mean, it is so nice. The whole software experience, how Android Pie uh, has switched to gestures for Pixel 3 is super nice. It was really nice just to like hold the phone. <clears throat> it really felt premium, um, which I think was a problem for a lot of people with especially the original Pixel. It didn't really feel like it was up to par with the iPhone and the Galaxy phones. So I think they've really caught up in that department to put out a premium nice phone. Do you think it's like the glass back that makes it feel competitive with the those glass phones? back does feel really okay. nice. Um so and it just really looks nice. So I think I'm definitely gonna wait for next year to decide on what phone I go with. I ended up just getting a new case for my iPhone <laughs> ten uh instead of going to the ten S Max. Um because I'm just gonna wait and then next year I'll get to reevaluate and I can get off of my iPhone plan if I want. Yeah, that should be good. Um, so now to kind of the story behind why I was back in the Apple store this week is because I got the call that my phone was back in Omaha. So I made the drive over there and picked it up. And, uh, if you guys recall, I sent my phone in or I had to go to the Apple store so that they could inspect my phone and then ship it to a third party repair service that would then inspect my phone and supposedly fix it. Um, and my main frustration with that was all that trouble can't really be worth their time because I'm assuming that they're just going to replace my phone uh, anyways and just end up giving me a new phone. So they should have just done it in the store or mailed me the new phone. But what ended up happening was I get there. They're like, here's your repaired phone. I take it. I look at it. I'm like, okay, this has none of the scratches on the case at all or anything <laughs> that my old phone has. And then I look at the repair invoice that I got emailed and it was like, uh, literally just one item, like replacement iPhone. I was like, <laughs> so all that work and the third party server just ended up replacing my iPhone anyways. Yeah. But you got a fun week and a half with an iPhone six. Yeah, seriously. I guess it gave me some insights, but I'm very happy to be back on my iPhone seven with the like 256 gigs of storage. Yeah. All right. So you want to kick off the news stories? Yeah. So one thing that's kind of uh, this was an interesting post for me to read because I use the dark mode on the new Mac OS. One of the biggest drawbacks is in Safari when you go to basically any website, the background is white. Um, so there's this new push now that Mac OS has dark mode. Apple is pushing this new standard for CSS, which is like the style that websites are built on, to add a new attribute called preferred color scheme. So that based on the settings of your... Um, operating system, the website can see if you're using a dark mode or normal and set the background of their website accordingly. So if we see a lot of other websites adapting this, it could be really good for um, people using dark mode and I'm assuming Windows will implement something similar. Yeah. So one thing is I know dark mode is one of actually the most difficult things to implement in an operating system because there's so many places where different colors occur and so many dynamic colors that happen that you it's very difficult to get everything to work properly and we can do an entire podcast just on dark mode but um <clears throat> it'll be really interesting to see where dark mode gets because dark mode with programmers has been very popular for a long time um in IDEs when you're coding, it's nice to have dark mode on. Um, I use dark mode on macOS Mojave as well, and I've really loved it. The dark mode notes app is super nice. Yeah. That's kind of how we record the podcast is looking at the notes app, and it's a lot nicer to look at the dark mode one while uh, going through the whole podcast. So I, I am definitely pro dark mode. Dark mode, my favorite uh, new dark mode themed app is a calendar. Do you like that one? I, I'm actually not sure if I've used the dark oh, mode yeah, calendar Oh, yeah, because you yet. use Google Calendar. I do so use the, Google the Calendar. the calendar's dark mode and all the colors are shifted in a way that it's just more muted and I think it looks really sleek. 
Oh yeah, that does look really nice. Yeah. It's just got like a red, orange. I can't tell. I'm colorblind, so <laughs> it's got it's got a nice color scheme. Yeah, that's my favorite one though. Um, so there were a lot of like plugins, uh, third party like extensions for Safari that tried to implement this feature, but I think that the long term solution is definitely to like try to get standards going across websites. So when you go to Google.com. It knows if your machine's trying to use dark mode or light mode. Yeah. Okay, so our next news topic, do you want to take this one? Yeah. So this past weekend it was announced that IBM is acquiring the cloud computing company Red Hat for $34 billion. They're buying them at $190 per share, which was like a 64% increase. So this is actually a really big move for IBM. Obviously, it's $34 billion, but it's kind of been criticized Uh because IBM stock has not been doing all that well. Um, the company has kind of been headed towards its deathbed. It's it's still pushing along, but a lot of people are calling this like a desperate grab at trying to save their own company, but some are calling it a really smart move. So the the cloud computing market is really important these days because so many... Uh, companies need cloud computing. That's how most tech companies work: is they pay for someone else to do their computing, and then they do all they write all their code, and then they pay for somebody else's computers to run it. So, IBM kind of wants to get into this whole space even more. Um, so that's why they bought Red Hat. And what's interesting is the government is going through like three or four major cloud computing bids right now so i'd be interested to see if ibm tries to get in late on one of those um with oh, yeah. red hat but they are still competing against aws and microsoft and google yeah so ibm's like made their fortune off of building mainframes which obviously is not hot anymore so yeah. their biggest services right now are these kind of higher level um uh like um web hosted services they provide like their Watson API mm -hmm. and that sort of thing so they can do things like you can pay them um, and they will handle like speech recognition for you yeah so this move to kind of own the software that a lot of servers run on allows them to kind of more vertically integrate which is a thing that companies of their size love to do all the time so yeah now they can own the software that runs on the servers that they own that powers the services that they sell. Yeah. So IBM has historically been one of the smartest companies. They have some really brilliant software that they create. Um, so I would I would love to see where this goes. Yeah, and Red Hat's kind of been one of the main bastions of like true open source. Like yeah. Like a good example of that. And IBM historically has not been like that. So it's kind of a hot topic in the uh, in like the programmer conversations right now that this like huge open source uh, um, software company got acquired by a company that's like not known for doing that sort of thing well. But yeah. Yeah. I don't know a whole lot about this, so we're going to kind of just keep on moving and go yeah. on to the Apple event. Yeah. So last week we made our predictions and then the event happened on Tuesday. Honestly, I was kind of underwhelmed. Yeah. Um, I think it happens to me pretty much every Apple event these days where I just get so excited thinking about all the possibilities of what could be on there, and then they launch like two or three things, and yeah. I end up wishing for the other two or three that I also wish they announced. Especially after the last iPhone event. The last iPhone event was really good. Um, it was missing AirPods, and so I thought, wow, this iPad event will have AirPods. We had pretty much said that would be the absolute like lock in that bet that's what they're going to announce yeah that was one of the things i was most certain about was that they were going to do the airpods with the hey siri and the whole event there was no airpods tim cook at the last second does the we can't leave you we have one more thing and they bring out a musical guest instead of announcing another piece of hardware yeah which i thought was crazy so i don't know i'm thinking perhaps um because we'll get to this later, um, but maybe the next AirPods will be USB-C charging, uh, and the next iPhone will be USB-C charging, and they're just waiting on that. Uh, but we'll have to wait for that. So let's go through our predictions, uh, because they announced less than what we predicted, but we did predict everything that was actually announced. So the first thing that we had guessed would happen was an iPad Mini 5, which unfortunately didn't happen. Yeah, um, this wasn't 
something that was super on my radar until I saw stuff about hardware leaks. Yeah. So people were predicting that, like, oh, they're manufacturing, like, this size screen. It's probably going to be an iPad mini. And then some way or another, that just never actually came to fruition. I really think with the new iPad uh, Pro, that kind of style for an iPad mini would have been really nice. Well, what I thought was crazy was um, the iPad mini is so old at this point that I thought it would be something that they would just kind of ignore in their lineup. Mm -hmm. But at the end, when they were summarizing their kind of current iPad lineup, they talked about the iPad Mini Four as one of the en as one of the entry level iPads. It's like I can't believe that yeah. they're still like putting that up front on stage. It's like, here's one of our options for you. Is that's it? three years old. The I know. Pro is brand new, and then the most recent iPad is a year old. So it's like they really maybe WWDC next uh, next year in June will have. A new release for the iPad Mini, but life goes on. Yeah, I'm not going to get my hopes up for that one. Yeah. What they did announce was the iPad Pro. I am very excited about this. Yeah, so the iPad Pro, um, the way I would describe it is it's kind of the um, bezel-less slate, uh, just a pure screen that it's always been working towards now. Yeah, it's if you took a MacBook Pro and you detached the screen from the keyboard what you were holding that screen would be the iPad Pro essentially with as much power as a MacBook. Yeah, so they um no longer have a top and bottom chin where the sides are skinnier than the top and bottom. It's just one uniform uh pretty thin bezel all the way around. Not as thin as iPhone 10, but thinner than what's currently on the sides of the iPad. And so it's just there's no real um wrong way to hold it because it's always oriented um with like the same bezel on each side. And they mm -hmm. made Face ID be able to work in whatever orientation you're holding it. Yeah, I really so the, appreciate it. Yeah, that. so the Face ID on the iPad, no matter how you pick it up, it'll just unlock for you. Mm -hmm. So it does have Face ID. Uh, it has the True Depth cameras. So it has all those sensors, and it learned how to read faces in every direction. Um, there is no uh, OLED screen that we had thought could happen. We assumed that's because of... Uh, no or no Apple Pencil support, so it does have the li Liquid Retina uh, LCD screen, which we had said they would probably do if the OLED couldn't support the Apple Pencil. Uh, so we were right on that account. Uh, speaking of the Apple Pencil, though, this new Apple Pencil is a huge upgrade. Yeah, so instead of being the normal spherical regular pencil that they have, there's kind of a flat side and it's a little thicker, mm -hmm. which is supposed to be more ergonomic, but the flat side is for attaching it to the side of the iPad. So you can magnet it in and snap it on, kind of like it works for the Surface Books. And it charges there as well. Yeah, except it charges, which unlike the Surface Books, which use, like, I think quadruple A batteries in their yeah. pens, which they're supposed to last a year, but it's still kind of nice that the iPad has, like, these advanced features and it lets you just kind of snap it on yeah. and keep it charging. And yeah. the other thing that they changed about the pencil is that um, there's a touch-sensitive area towards the bottom of it, so you can tap and double-tap for different actions. Um, one of the cool demos of that was that uh, in the Notes app, you can double tap to switch between the eraser and whatever you were currently using that would allow you to erase a lot quicker. Yeah, that seemed like a really useful thing to have. Um, so we also talked about the possibility of the new iPad being USB-C, and they actually did it. Yeah, so I was surprised. Not only did they do USB-C, but they also did it um, for the purpose of connecting external devices. Yeah. Which I didn't really think that they would push. Like, there's pictures on their website of, like, look, plug your iPad directly into your camera. Like, if you're mm -hmm. a photographer, this can be for you. You can charge your phone with your iPad. Yeah. It was um, plugging it into the camera, charging your phone, and then, crazily enough, plugging it into a display. Yeah. So it was like, let me plug... I'm working um, in video editing on my iPad Pro. Let me plug in my 5K monitor and put the video up on there so I can see how it's working. Yeah. Which I thought was crazy, and I didn't really think that they went into enough detail on, like, how that works, because I would like to see... Because obviously it's not just mirroring, mm -hmm. which is right now the only way you can uh, use external displays is to duplicate your iPad's display onto that display. But they were showing her doing some editing on the iPad and viewing the video on the screen. Yeah, this iPad is so powerful. I think they compared it to the Xbox One S. Um, so really, it is insanely powerful for a tablet, which also means it can support an actual 5K display. Um, with the 7-core, is it 7-core graphics processor? Yeah, I don't know. 
but yeah, it's, it's crazy. So they had it, um, they showed that it can support a 5K external display, um, and then it can also like run NBA 2K18 yeah. on basically console level graphics, mm-hmm. and all of that in a package that's like extremely thin. Yeah, so it's about exactly the size of a sheet of paper. Yeah, um, the 12 inch is almost exactly the size of the sheet of paper, which is significantly smaller than it used to be. So. And it's really thin too. Yeah, with the 12 inch display, they just shrunk the bezels and kept the display the same size. But with the old um, 10 and a half inch, they pushed the screen towards the edge of the size. So now it's an 11 inch display in the same body. Yeah. So one thing I am kind of worried about is this is so thin and so powerful. I can only imagine it's going to heat up if you try to do too much on it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's so, aluminum. These aluminum yeah. devices, they get super hot, but I think most people are usually using a case on it or something. Yeah. But if you're playing 2K, I'm assuming, yeah, it's going to heat up. It's it's going to heat up, and I'm not sure how well the battery will last, how big of a battery they can fit in a chassis yeah. that small. Um, but, yeah, that'll be really interesting. One of the weird things was that they, round, they um, straightened out the edges so that you can actually uh-huh. set it just by itself vertically. Yeah, that was really interesting. I'm it's, not sure how yeah, it's useful no longer that is, curved but... on the side. And I don't know if that's for a usefulness thing or just an aesthetic thing. It kind of looks more like a pro device. Yeah, it really does look like the tablet version of a MacBook Pro. Yeah, it's got the same type of like sharp but still rounded edges. I was kind of wondering why do they keep a camera on it? For the front facing or the yeah or the rear facing camera because there's a camera bump now on an yeah, iPad. The camera bump is crazy because on the iPad, like one of its main use cases is just laying flat on the table. Mm-hmm. So I think that's another like thing where you're seeing they're clearly expecting you to have a case on it. Yeah. Because like with your iPhone and with these iPads now, if you have a case on it, it's not going to rock when you have a camera bump. But uh, yeah, that's super annoying. Um, one of the things that they were pushing with the camera bump, or I mean with the iPad's camera is the AR capabilities. Yeah. Like they're talking about how it's above like even most like uh, current laptops and how it can work for like AR production. Yeah. So you want to talk about the Photoshop demo that they showed? I actually didn't get to see that. Okay. So they had um, someone, so someone from Adobe was on stage and they were showing the new version of Photoshop that they're bringing to iOS. So previously they had Photoshop Express, which is a, a handicapped version they didn't have like really the full features, but now they're porting the real Photoshop engine to iOS, and it can do all the different layers and different actions that you could do before, and it's all set up to work with the Apple Pencil. So, their demo was this lady who was making what looked like this forest. Um, it looked like she was editing a picture of a forest, so she kind of like brightens one of the flowers, and then she zooms out and it shows that each individual flower in this entire like forest scene is its own layer. Oh, man. And so she um, is editing this massive um, Photoshop file, a real Photoshop file that she could import to her laptop or from her laptop the same way she would do it. And then when she was done, she took it into another Adobe app where she displayed it in AR, and each layer had um, uh, depth to it. So it was set up like a diorama, and she could put like animated butterflies in the forest, and she was moving the iPad around with the AR camera. That's kind crazy. Kind of setting up like a almost a pop-up book type display with all the different layers that she had in Photoshop. And it was something like thousands of different layers of flowers. Oh, and the iPad was able to handle it all with like its limited amount of RAM and everything. Yeah. So <clears throat> the iPad Pro really, this new one really put the Pro into it. Um, yeah. They're really going for it. I mean, getting Photoshop on stage saying like, look, you creatives, you can use this now. Like we're giving it the green light, full version of Photoshop go wild. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how many people can switch from using their laptops which i mean if you're buying a macbook pro you can if you want that 15 inch screen you can spend upward of like three thousand dollars on it oh yeah whereas if you're buying this ipad it's a little over one thousand mm-hmm. so i'm just interested to see if we get people starting to switch over yeah uh, another interesting thing they took out the headphone jack um i don't know if that's for continuity throughout all their mobile devices um maybe i can't imagine they couldn't find a place for it but they did take out the headphone jack on this device. Yeah, it seems pretty unnecessary just because there's so much space in an iPad, but, I mean, I'm sure that they have some justification for it, if not just saying, like, we don't really support headphone jacks anymore except on our Macs. But they also, they do not sell um, their wired headphones with with, uh, USB-C. 
Um, oh yeah, so there's no way to so, plug in Apple headphones yeah, in your they, iPad. They do have a 3.5 millimeter to USB C converter uh, dongle on the Apple Store website, um, but it'll run you like nine dollars. That's kind of crazy. Just use AirPods. Yeah, just use AirPods, um, which we still wish they would have yeah. released. So the other thing that they changed is they added more magnetic contact points on the back mm-hmm. of the iPad that allow you to um, snap uh, cases into it. Yeah. So their super skinny pad folio case um, with a keyboard built in is able to snap onto the back and then magnet the keyboard around to the front. Yeah. Which is pretty neat. Um, I really like that because the the grill on the side looks really nice and I would hate to cover that up with uh, all of any sort of case and I'm sure yep, like any the, case would kind of ruin the whole aesthetic that they're going for. Yeah, the case on the iPad in front of me right now is probably the pretty much exact reason why they did this because yeah. this is a pretty popular case and it just kind of uh, thickens the iPad up a lot and uh, makes the bezels look a little bit ridiculous because it has to wrap around and grab all the edges of the iPad. Yeah. So yeah. I'm interested to kind of test out um, the palm rejection on this iPad since the bezels are so small. So I, I kind of want to go in and just hold one and mess around while kind of getting my palm in on the yeah, uh, that's on true. top of the screen. My experience with my palm rejection um, on my iPad Pro is that I basically just stop thinking about it. Like when I write, I set my wrist down on my iPad and just start writing. Um, and I've been pretty satisfied with that. Um, so after seeing these new iPads, I am glad that they are out. They're really pushing the iPad line forward. And hopefully this new push towards Pro gets more like a software development style applications on the App Store. Yeah. That would allow me to do my like heavy workloads on my iPad. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, um, what you're really getting is a much nicer looking screen, which doesn't add much more functionality, just a bigger screen and a small body and the nicer Apple Pencil that charges on the side. Yeah. And other than that, you're getting the USB-C port, um, which could have... A pretty good use case if you can plug it into your camera directly. Yeah. But I know people who already do that with the current iPad, just with like lightning adapters. Mm-hmm. So I was really happy with this event, but it was nothing revolutionary. That makes me kind of dislike the iPad that's in front of me right now. And yeah. I'll definitely be fine just sticking with it. I do think it was the perfect one for them to release, though, because if you were holding out on the iPad Pro waiting for a great new one, this is a great new iPad Pro. This is in my opinion, the best tablet that's been released yet. Yeah, it definitely looks the part. Um, I would recommend looking at a picture of this thing. Like, it is sleek. It's one of the most, like, beautifully beautifully designed devices that I've seen in a long time. Yeah. Um, And it really just, like, feels like they're pushing computing in a big way. Yeah, and Apple killed bezels on their mobile devices. That was the last bezel remaining on uh, mobile devices that they sold besides like the iPad in the iPad mini, but I assume those will get a similar form factor to the iPad pro. Yeah. Eventually as that likes, as that stuff trickles down. Yeah. So I really think this is a revolutionary tablet in that it's insanely powerful. It's USB C. It looks so good. Um, and it's something that I would be happy if I had been waiting for one, uh, for the event to get one. Um, but it's not like you can't get, uh, an older iPad Pro and not be happy with it anymore. So I think it was it was a really good device for them to release. Yep, definitely makes me excited about the future of the iPad. Um, another place where they got rid of their probably biggest remaining bezel on a mobile device was the new MacBook Air. Yes, so the new MacBook Air is awesome. I really like this device. Yeah, so they shipped a new MacBook Air that kind of has the... Uh, Same styling as the MacBook Pro with the black bezels on the screen, kind of thin the bezels out a little bit. Yeah. Um, And then give the keyboard the new butterfly switches. And Touch ID as well. And Touch ID, yep. But no um, Touch Bar, which is definitely something that they're trying to keep with the Pro line. Um, But this new um, MacBook Air kind of further blurs the line with their MacBook lineup right now. Honestly, I think they just killed their own 11 and 12 inch MacBook. There is zero reason you should get a MacBook over a MacBook Air at this point. Yeah, they're technically lighter um, and like you can buy them with a one inch smaller screen, but the benefits that you get for the MacBook Air are like so much more, like two USB-C ports. Two USB-C ports. That was really nice because then you can charge and do data at the same time. You can do different things with it. Um, 
that was my biggest qualm with the regular MacBooks is that there's only one USB-C port, but also the MacBook Air, more powerful. It has uh, Touch ID. It has it has the nice big uh, keypad or um, trackpad with butterfly switches. It's it's really a nice uh, small laptop. Yeah, I think that the biggest thing that listeners should take away is that if you're looking for the entry level. MacBook at the most affordable price, like this new MacBook Air, is really where it is. Absolutely. Um, so here's something crazy that you are not going to believe. So the MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro both come in 13.3 inch screen sizes, and the MacBook Air is obviously the Air, like it's the smaller, thinner device. Yeah. But if you look at the dimensions listed uh, on this article by The Verge and on the Apple website, the uh, dimensions for the MacBook Air are 11.9 by 8.3 by 0.6 and then the dimensions for the macbook pro 13 inch are 11.9 and 8.3 again by 0.5 huh the macbook pro is technically thinner in height uh folded shut than the macbook air and i that's think that's because of the taper of the macbook air yeah because the macbook air starts a little thicker and then it goes down yeah so um that's kind of one of the things that I don't like all that much about non-pro MacBooks is that I like the the feeling of holding a completely even MacBook. Mm-hmm. So I really like my Pro and how easy it is to hold it because it's not thinner at any side. Um, but it does get thinner on the MacBook Airs. Although the MacBook Air, this new one, is really nice. Yeah, so. that the thinner taper is definitely what's defined the MacBook Air lineup is the way that it starts thick and then uh, slims out as you get away from the hinge. But uh, I just thought it was crazy that on paper they're selling a MacBook Air that has a thicker like uh, dimension than the MacBook Pro. Yeah. Um, and then also, if you look at the price difference, the MacBook Pro is only a hundred dollars more in the base model. Really. Which I think um, definitely adds a little bit of confusion to their line, just how close those are. But the MacBook Air is also has a more updated like chipset and it's better for like yeah mobile style computing if you're not doing a bunch of like pro stuff yeah so if you're basically i would say if you're not trying to like game export photos or be a video editor go for the macbook air yeah it's really a nice computer it's um something that i think would go well in enterprise um that's another thing about that ipad pro is i think it'll be really nice in enterprise um because it's so powerful I think a lot of people could get a lot of things done. They could probably run a whole business off of one iPad Pro. Yeah, seriously. Um, so the last device that we'll get to is probably the least interesting is the yeah. Mac Mini. It, it's a Mac Mini. Um, they updated it. It looks cool. It's space gray. has some really good I.O. It's got two USB-A, four USB-C, HDMI, Ethernet. Uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet is an option. Um, it's... It's nice. <laughs> it is a Mac Mini. I mean, it's their yeah. headless machine. There's definitely some enterprise companies that are extremely happy oh, to yeah. have a faster up to, version. Up to 64 gigabytes of RAM? Yeah. That's actually pretty insane. That Mac Mini, you can carry around a computer that's one of the most powerful that Apple sells. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it'll definitely be good for companies that use these for like their internal servers. They'll love it. But, mm-hmm. I mean, it's not that exciting from a consumer point of view. Yeah. Cool's better, so server racks will look and be easier to uh, control, and it, they won't overheat as much. But it's a Mac Mini. That's all we really have to say because neither of us use Mac Minis. Yeah. <laughs> for good reason. There's not really much reason to use a Mac Mini over a MacBook in college. Yep. So the one thing that remains the big elephant in the room that we really didn't think was going to be there anyways is air power. Still no air power. Yep, still no air power. I think that was the official uh, funeral for air power. Yeah, I think that was the last nail in the coffin. Um, I think if we were going to see it, we would have seen it then. Um, And, I mean, it's 2019, or 2018 is almost over, so they're they're missing their window. They're Mm -hmm. not saying anything about it. It's a pretty clear sign. Especially with this seeming beginning of a shift to, to USB-C, I would think they'd wait for air power. Um, I'm sure they'll eventually come out with something, but they'll wait for the new AirPods to come out with wireless charging, wait for everything to be USB-C, um, and then they'll charge everything on one pad that they sell, at least. So you keep saying the shift to USB-C. Do you think the iPhones yeah. are going to get USB-C? So that's kind of... As soon as I saw that the iPad Pro was USB-C... My brain went to, 
oh, the next iPhone will be USB-C. It's not an S year. Um, they changed the MacBooks to USB-C a couple years ago. They now have the iPad Pro on USB-C. Um, I'm sure we'll see an iPad and iPad mini, hopefully an iPad mini update at WWDC in June, if not at the iPhone event next year, maybe? Question mark. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll see. I'm hoping next year we get a new iPad mini. They'll um, probably update the, because they had that iPad event in March this year. That was like the education iPad update. Yeah, yeah. So maybe they'll update the mini and the regular iPad. Yeah, that I'm hoping later. between Q1 and Q2 of 2019, we'll get an iPad mini 5 with USB-C, which makes me think that the iPhone 11 is, I guess, what we'll call it for now, um, will have USB-C in it. And I would really appreciate that because I have the MacBook Pro, um, so I could just charge my phone with my uh, laptop charger. Yeah, and the crazy thing about that would be Android phones use USB-C, mm -hmm. so it would be like the first time in maybe history that they would all be on the same page. Yeah, every flagship phone of 2019 could use USB-C, which is kind of the equilibrium we've been looking for. Um, I don't know if I believe that this is going to happen. I think that they might stick with Lightning, and I think um, one of the reasons that that'll happen is because of thickness. I think that the USB-C port, it's slightly thicker, and on the iPhone XR, it's a small detail, but the lightning port um, on the bottom of the phone is not actually uh, centered vertically. Like, it has to be pushed further towards the bottom just because of the limitations of even having a lightning size port on that phone. So a USB-C port, it's like, it's, a, it's not uh, significantly bigger when you're looking at it, but when you're designing a phone to be as thin as possible, it's not um, the same... Uh, like, I don't know, like, Apple is just, they keep squeezing these devices thinner and thinner, and yeah. I wouldn't imagine them going thicker to add USB-C port, but I would definitely love it if they did. Oh, yeah. USB-C would be really nice. Um, so, you also had a long shot guess of an iOS mouse. I think we were closer to getting an iOS mouse than AirPower yesterday. Yeah, um, so what I want to know is if you're running Photoshop or some video editing program and you have your external display plugged in and you have something up on the screen, how do you interact with it? Yeah. Because there's no mouse, you have to be touching your iPad screen somehow. Seems like you have to just hold the iPad in front of you and then also have it up on the screen, which seems kind of counterintuitive because the whole point of the iPad is that you look at it and you touch and you control it. But there has to be some sort of an interface for the uh, screen on the iPad because if like I want to press play on the video, uh, what I would think I would do is like click on it with the mouse or tap the screen. Yeah. But you can't because it's not a touch screen. Mm -hmm. So you must be able to like say, I want to play this video here and have the controls for it on my iPad somewhere. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see how that all works out because you do have to be able to control an extended display if it's not just mirroring. Yeah, so I think it'll probably be built around some like pretty uh, neat, like specific use cases. Like they showed just like maybe throwing photos and videos up there. I doubt yeah. you'll be like playing games on the screen and controlling it from your iPad, but yeah. who knows? Yeah. So overall, I think this iPad event was a little less than we hoped for. Um, it was still nice to see the iPad Pro. The Mac Mini, it really deserved an update. Same with the MacBook Air. Wish we could have seen that iPad Mini. Um, yeah. But we, we had pretty much all of the predictions on point for what they actually did release, although I wish they had released everything we had predicted. Um, but yeah, they, nothing, no big shockers that really surprised us, um, and I'm super happy with the iPad Pro update. I think the that visually and aesthetically, it's way more of an improvement than I thought that they could pull off, so for sure. I'm pretty pleased with, with uh, what we got to see. Yeah, so um, I think we were a little more uh, excited than we should have been, but it was, it was a good overall event, and I'm excited to see... All the devices that kind of go based off of these devices next year, whether it be a new iPad, an iPad mini, um, whether it be an update or a merging um, between the MacBook and the MacBook Air, um, and then maybe AirPods. Uh, but we'll have to see. Yep. We'll have to just keep on waiting. But I mean, I'm pretty happy with what we got today. I think it was a good event. Yeah. And I'm glad we could talk about it. Yeah. Anything else from you? Nope. I think that's it. Uh, it's been another episode of Hacker Slacker. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. All right. Bye.